Okay, thanks very much. Um, he blessedly did not mention the fact that also in 2008, I ran for governor of the state of North Carolina as an independent or third party candidate, and it is there that I learned that if I'm going to get applause, I have to leave them myself. <laughs> it explains the outburst there at the beginning. So for that, I apologize. It always astonishes the introducer. Oh! So we think of rights as being economic, political, or human. It matters a lot if we say the state should protect my rights. Well, what is the origin of them? What is the source of having rights? And what does it mean? What are the distinctions we might make? So <clears throat> are we allowed to act? prevented from acting, or obliged to provide things to others, and at what price? Now, a lot of the work that I've done has been on price gouging laws, rent control ceilings, things like that, uh, maybe kidney sales. So the question is, if there's a willing buyer and a willing seller, should the state intervene? The arguments that economists make for rights tend to be consequentialist, that is, they have good consequences. Political rights require a deference to dissent on the assumption that no person holds the truth. Now that means that you sometimes have to listen to something that you disagree and you would think is dumb. And if you've watched the debates from the two state sponsored parties over the last six months, you probably have had that reaction to at least some people. But it requires that we defer to people we disagree. And then human rights are something that you have just by virtue of being a human being. So we use rights in all three of those senses and in others besides. So I want to distinguish economic rights and political rights. Are they actually different? Is one more important? And in particular, if you're going to give advice to a developing nation, which would you say that they should try to develop first? So we've seen a number of countries lately follow the advice that the U.S. gave them and try to have elections very soon. And then very soon, they became military dictatorships. Egypt tried to have a constitution. We said you need to have elections right away, and Egypt is now a military dictatorship. Iraq tried to have elections. Do economic rights come first? That is, do you have to have sufficient economic development before people care enough about political rights for that to make sense? It seems like if you look at nations that have developed, a lot of them developed economically first. So maybe political rights are what economists call a normal good. That is one that we want once our income reaches a certain level. Now, the answer of the American founders, and also in some ways of Austrian economics, is that those rights are actually mutually reinforcing and organically related. You can't make the kind of separation that I just tried to make. Public opinion is often hostile to what we see as economic rights. Now, there are people who think that that's just a failure of education, but always, if you disagree with someone, and many people, if they find someone disagrees with them, they say, well, it just must be you need to be educated. But in fact, it's perfectly reasonable to hold that other position. Maybe it's just a failure of those on the political right to recognize that, time, that times change. Something that you often hear is crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is a perversion of market incentives. And the way to think about crony capitalism is that it's more profitable to hire lobbyists than it is engineers. In traditional, traditional entrepreneurship, the way to make money was to make a new product, make it better, or make it cheaper. But in a crony capitalist system, you can make money by paying lobbyists to have government agencies prevent competitors from being able to make products that are new, or better, or cheaper. <coughs> now, to the extent that it's more profitable, I guess you can't blame corporations for doing that, just because you can't blame dogs for eating out of the garden. We don't have to put the garbage out there where they can get it. So is it, a, is it a problem with markets, or is it a problem with the state? 
that we have these incentives to invest in lobbyists rather than engineers. Classical entrepreneurship is being replaced in the United States, as it has been in much of Europe, by what economists call rent-seeking behavior. So I think that trend can be reversed, but you can tell my bias, I think we have to do a better job of educating the public on the difference, and that's what I want to talk about. So you should always start with the cartoon. <laughs> I don't know if you know the cartoon Leo, but the cartoon is, the conceit of it is that Leo doesn't speak. So Leo's in outer space, flying along in his outer spaceship, and then he crash lands on the moon. He realizes he can't breathe because he's in outer space. There's an alien there who is selling spacesuits. And the sign says, spacesuits, $25 because you can't hold your breath forever. Is the alien acting badly? Should this be illegal? Or do people have the right to enter into mutually beneficial contracts that they themselves negotiate? Well, he was in a pretty rough position to negotiate a contract. There's an asymmetry of bargaining power. You might want to say, no we're going to outlaw this contract because Leo's bargaining power is so weak. I think you want to think about that for a minute. What's going to happen if we make this transaction illegal? Leo going to die. He's going to die. How are you helping Leo by killing him? So the point is that there may be situations where one party has an abject bargaining position, and yet, taking away their economic rights does them more harm than goods. If you walk, you walk into a sweatshop, sweatshop, that's a lot of y'all are economic students, what's the definition of a sweatshop? Ma'am, sweatshop. Economic student. She's a sweatshop? No, she said economic student. She, she totally gave you up, right under the bus. Well, um, I'm assuming when other countries outsource and uh, they did other Products. Such shops are usually the, the lower ring of uh, businesses. They have like, the minimum standards for what people work or employed as. That, I think that's, that's probably about right. Most people, when they think of a sweatshop, it is a factory, usually in another country, and it has rates of pay, <coughs> safety, and working conditions that are much less than you would find in the United States. Should sweatshops be illegal? Should we not allow companies to buy from sweatshops? <clears throat> Suppose you walk into a sweatshop and say, who wants to be fired? I am the great and powerful Westerner. I've come here to save you. Who wants to be fired? Who raises their hand? Nobody. They're like Leo. We actually need this transaction. If you fire people from a sweatshop, they have to sell drugs, work in the fields, sell their bodies as prostitutes. That's the best job they can get. You're not helping them but by denying them economic rights. Even though it's very tempting to say, I don't think they should have to work in sweatshops. It doesn't follow that you're helping them by preventing them from working in sweatshops. So economic rights are dicey. Saying that we're going to restrict people's access to the only economic activity that will raise their position may make you feel better, but it's not clear that it's a benefit to them. And let me say about the cartoon, I don't know why Leo could breathe when he was flying through space. It's just a cartoon, let it go. <laughs> <clears throat> what rights should we have? Sometimes we think in terms of evolution. And when you think about institutional evolution, that's an interesting question. Do institutions evolve, or do they change through conscious choice? Well, one way we might think of evolution is the coyote. A coyote is a dog-like creature that is well suited to its environment. And in fact, coyotes can now be found in much of North America. My neighborhood in North Carolina, out in the woods, you can hear coyotes. So coyotes are really great, terrific, evolved predators.
What about chihuahuas? Well, there's more chihuahuas than there are coyotes. And chihuahuas are doing something right. But chihuahuas are designed, I actually had, uh, I used to drive a carpool, and one of the kids one day was talking about a chihuahua. What <laughs> is he talking about? It, looks, it does look like chihuahua. Which one of those is better designed? Well, chihuahuas were designed by, by intentional human intervention. Coyotes were designed by evolution. Institutions might evolve in either of those two ways. There's a lot of thistles in the wild. There's a lot of rose bushes. Rose bushes take a lot of care. But there's a lot of rose bushes. They're doing something right. We designed rose bushes. Thistles just happen. Which is the right way to think about rules? Wild turkeys, notoriously smart. I hunt very difficult to find wild turkeys. Domesticated turkeys supposedly are so dumb that during rainstorms they look up into the sky and drown. That's pretty dumb. Look, rain. So I want you to think in those two terms. Evolution can produce that. Oh my god, it's a giant fat chihuahua and it's wearing pearls. Run! <laughs> and evolution can produce that. Giant fat chihuahua wearing pearls. Run. How do institutions evolve? How does our thinking of rights change? Is it a constant, is it a thought process? Or is it that some societies that have certain conceptions of rights are more likely to prosper and produce prosperity and security for their citizens? Y'all can't see this, so I can make pretty much any claim that I want. <laughs> but on the left hand side is the USDA requirements for food handling. It's based on an advanced theory of germ pathology, and it's from the latest standards of food safety. The one on the right is kosher dietary rules from Maimonides in about 1000 AD. And they're almost exactly the same. How can that be? Well, the kosher dietary rules were based on what people noticed not given the germ theory of pathology, but given a God is really pissed at you theory of pathology. So in a desert climate, if you eat pork, mm -hmm. you're likely to pick up small parasitic pathogens that, after they leave your stomach, start eating your major muscle groups from the inside. And you start doing this weird dance. <laughs> So they said that you were possessed by demons, so clearly eating pork meant you were possessed by demons. Don't do that. If you used a knife and didn't clean it, demons would get you. <laughs> That's a pretty good theory, in the sense that it gives you exactly the same result. So what kind of understanding do we have to have? Both of those things mean that trichina, the trichinosis, doesn't result in me dying screaming. One of those is what we think is a correct theory of germ pathology. The other is observing what works. I think the best, briefest statement of the argument for capitalism is not about greed and it's not about self-interest. It's this. It's the relation between property, voluntary exchange, and price as a connected set of consequentialist and natural rights implications. There's actually no way to evaluate them separately because, as I said before, they're organic, they're integrated. You can't really evaluate them even separately. Economic rights are civil rights, and civil rights require economic freedom. You can't have civil rights without economic freedom. And you can't have economic freedom without basic civil rights. So the, the binary that I posed before, which one should we try to develop first, may be a false one. John Locke was one of the originators of a theory of property that many people subscribe to. 
And he used a kind of rational agent model. And he was interested in the coincidence of self-interest and the general interest. Now, book one of the, the first treatise that Locke wrote was more really just Filmer Nation. He was filmernating against Robert Filmer. But the message of the second, and people usually read the second treatise, governs the Government is limited in its power and exists only by the consent of the governed. So in Locke's view, all people are born free. They might be imprisoned by the institutions of the society that they find themselves in, but of nature, of just by virtue of being a human being, you have certain rights. So he wrote the two treatises in 1690. Before that, he wrote the letter concerning toleration. I put up there Venditio, um, relatively unknown writing by John Locke. I recommend it. It's only four pages. Uh, it's actually one that I helped find and reestablish as being uh, available. It's, it's, it's in my new. Um, Oxford Anthology on PBE. So if you're interested in John Locke, you might look at Vendidio. It asks the question, when is the market price just? Locke begins with the question, what is political power? And what is the appropriate and the end objective of government? So what he's asking is, how would we justify political authority? When is it legitimate for one person to coerce another? When is it legitimate for one person to coerce another? So he's interested in the right to make laws, to enforce them at penalty of death, and to establish penalties related to regulating and preserving property and defending the commonwealth from foreign attack, all for what he calls the public good. Well, what is the public good? How would we decide? How would we know? And under what circumstances can someone coerce another? We probably all think that self-defense is an example. But what about if you and I just disagree? Suppose you and I disagree about public policy. Under what circumstance can you use the force of the state to coerce me? Well, Locke contrasted his with Hobbes' view, which was, as you probably know, the war of all against all for Locke, the state of nature is actually a state of perfect freedom and equality. He thought the world was never without political or social structure. It would arise naturally with mankind. So he said, people living together according to reason, without a common superior on earth, with authority to judge between them, is properly the state of nature. That is, reason tells us that there are certain institutions without which we can't function very well. And he thought the central one of these was property. So much of what Locke is trying to do is justify property. Now, most of you have the sense that property is some, under some circumstances justified. But by what? By what is property justified? To the extent that if I say, no, no, I want that, you can enlist the coercive power of the state. Men with guns will come to defend it if it's my property against you. That is, I can defend myself against you, but the state will defend my property <coughs> against you. What would be the basis of such a power? <coughs> Locke's theory begins with the assertion that every person owns themselves and their labor. So the way that something becomes your property is when you combine your labor with it. Property that's acquired then through just acquisition is earned through the use of yourself and labor. We only need to limit accumulation if there is less than enough. So only labor can create property. Transfer does not create property. But if something's already property, I can buy it. My purchase is legitimate by virtue of the fact 
that the original owner combined his or her labor with it. So you have to go back to some original combination of labor. So it might work like this. In a great forest, I clear some land, I plant some corn, you come along and say, I'm really hungry, I want that corn. And you don't really own this. And I say, oh, I did because I cleared the land. And you say, but I can't get this myself. And you say, yes, you can, clear the land yourself. So Locke's answer would be, I deserve the corn because I cleared the land to make growing the corn possible. If that weren't true, I wouldn't have cleared the land in the first place, and no one would have corn. So, this is what's called Locke's proviso. Nor was this appropriation of any parcel of land by improving it any prejudice to any other man, since there was still enough and as good left. That's the proviso, enough and as good. I've been talking for a while, you're already tired. Wake up. <laughs> That's the proviso. Enough and as good. It's only mine if I combine my labor with it, if there is something else that you can combine your labor with. In effect, there was nevertheless left for others because of his enclosure for himself. So nobody could think himself injured by the drinking of another man, though he took a good draft, who had a whole river of the same water left him to quench his thirst. And in the case of land and water, where there's enough of both, it is perfectly the same. Well, if he's right, you have to justify property with the initial combination of labor. Are we confident that that's really the origin of most property? Locke thought that political power, therefore, must be limited. He was in favor of majority rule within reason. He also favored separation of powers. He thought there was no freedom where there is no law, but law is natural, which is not the same thing as legislation. So in terms of the development of institutions, there's a problem. He seems to think that property can always be justified as long as there's no scarcity. But actually, property rights are something that are expensive to identify, to maintain, and to enforce. In fact, the economist and physicist David Friedman has an interesting conjecture. Because if you have a group of people, the group is fairly small, we don't really need property because if I go out and catch something to eat, you can go out and catch something to eat. But suppose that we're in a setting where all the land is taken and I plant something. Well, I notice that when I plant something, you just steal it during the night. And I steal what you plant during the night. And it's really difficult for us to stay up all night and prevent the other person from stealing it. David Friedman actually thinks the origin of property is dogs, which is why I did the coyote and chihuahua thing. That and I really liked it. Because a dog is a property enforcement machine. It's territorial. If it smells or hears something, it barks at it and then tries to bite it. Which means that now I can plant stuff and have some sense that I'm likely to be able to harvest it. It reduces the transaction's cost of enforcing property. Now that's kind of whimsical, and it's probably not true, but it has something to do with the fact that when we start seeing exclusive private property and the transition in the Neolithic Revolution from hunter-gatherer societies to fixed agriculture, human beings also by that time had domesticated dogs. So it's, it is pretty true that it all happens at once. The problem with Locke's proviso is that society seem to develop property when, but only when, there's scarcity. So remember Locke says, as long as there's no scarcity, <coughs> then property is okay. But it seems like we only develop property in human societies when there starts to be scarcity. So Harold Demsett's fam famous paper in 1967 in the American Economic Review looks through the anthropology literature and finds that at least in Native American tribes in the United States, so long as population density was below a certain level, they didn't develop property rights. 
But if you start getting enough people that there's competition that results in overfishing, then they develop property rights. So he talks about the example of a tribe in New England that was, they would catch beaver and fish. And there was enough beaver and fish that they didn't need to worry about allocating it as property. But then once the population density reached a certain point, they would divide into plots of land by tribe and did subdivide those into five spaces. The five spaces were a circle in the middle and then four triangles around it. And then they would hunt and fish those triangles in a four year period. And they would leave the circle in the middle fallow so that they never took it. Now, there are many other institutions that were like that. That's an idiosyncratic one. But what was interesting was they didn't develop property rights until their scarcity. Property rights are probably a way of reducing the externality of overfishing. That means that if this is my property, I have no reason to take all of the resource because I'm still going to have access to it tomorrow. What's really the problem is what economists call the commons. So if you look at open oceans, pelagic fisheries, I have two choices. I can use long lines and only take the large fish, or I can use a trawler and take everything. <coughs> Clearly, it's better for the resource to use individual lines and throw back the ones that are too small. But if I'm doing that and you've got a trawler, I lose. So in the absence of some sort of regulation, we're all going to use trawlers, and in no time, all the fish are gone. And this has happened to a number of, of open ocean fisheries. Property rights are a solution to that problem. On the open range in the west, they had the same problem, where if somebody could just take all of the cattle, then the first person out there would take all of the cattle. They wouldn't grow to sufficient size. I wouldn't be able to work as a rancher. What was the solution? Well, for a long time, it was property rights in the form of brands. So branding indicated that this belonged to one or another rancher, and so we could solve the problem. But it's only because of the problem of scarcity. So the origin of property rights is actually dicey. The justification is dicey. Well, we might compare Locke's theory with Rousseau's. Rousseau was concerned about the relationship between the state and the, and the individual. He thought that society is based on an implicit contract. That contract delivers us from some prior state of nature. And the contract implies that the ruler is the people's agent, not their master. But he's not so concerned about individuals as the collective. So this is a famous quote from his, the second treatise on inequality. And let me just read it, because it's, it's, it's something. The first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortune might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone. If you once forget, and this is the important phrase, the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. The fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to no one. Well, why would you think that? If I take something, you can't have it. Why isn't property just theft? Why isn't property just theft? This is something all of us own, and I just say, wait, this is mine. Who the heck am I to put up a fence? Rousseau would ask. So for Rousseau, private property is the source pretty much of all evil. It's the origin of excessive self-love and self-interest. The institution of private property led to the establishment of a flawed society and government and law to protect property. The only solution then is to abandon private property because the state, as it is structured, is based on a false premise. So note the disagreement. For Locke, we have rights before the state. We create a state to help secure our property rights, which existed before. For Rousseau, 
Our rights are created by our relation to the state, by being embedded in a societal context. Property, then, is something that the state decides that we have. So the logical origins and the, the order in which these things are done is very important. So before people lived in societies, their activities were largely dominated by unreflective pursuits. The main concern was self-preservation. Cooperation was impossible. What we need to do is create a state that makes cooperation possible. Property prevents that in Rousseau's view because property sets us against each other. <coughs> James Madison, one of the framers of the US Constitution, probably the central framer, writer of the Constitution, had a short piece called Property that he published on 29th of March, 1792. Now by 1792, the Revolutionary War was long over. The Constitution had been ratified. Madison was worried about how the new nation under the Constitution was going to handle property. And he said, he defined property as that dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in exclusion of every other individual. In its larger and juster meaning, property embraces everything to which a man may attach a value and have a right, and which leads to everyone else the like advantage. Is that more like Locke or Rousseau? Well, it reminds you a little bit of Locke because it's almost like there's as much and as good. That is, I leave to other people the like advantage. However, everything may attach a value and have a right. He then goes on to say, in the former sense, a man's land or merchandise or money is called property. But in the latter sense, a man has a property to his opinions and the free communication of them. He has a property of peculiar value in his religious opinions and in the profession and practice dictated by them. Law, uh, Madison then is extending my property to my rights. The rights that I have, the political rights that I have are also my property and it's the state's job to protect those. That's really interesting. So that was Madison's concern. In a word, as a man is said to have a right to his property, he is equally said to have a property in his rights. I own the fact that I have a right to my political opinions, my religious opinions, and I get to express those without being punished for them, even if most people disagree. There's a paradox here. How in a democracy can we protect people from the majority? How in a democracy can we protect people from the majority? We can't let the majority decide what the majority gets to decide. But how can we stop them? Government is instituted to protect property of every sort, as well that which lies in the various rights of individuals, as that which the term particularly expresses. This being the end of government, that alone is a just government, which impartially secures to every man whatever is his own. So he's making a general claim it's not just physical property, but my opinions and my ability to express those opinions, political, religious, other ones. All of those things are my property. If there be a government which prides itself in maintaining the inviolability of property, which provides that none shall be taken directly, even for public use, and yet directly violates the property which individuals have in their opinions, their religion, their person, their faculty, Nay more, which indirectly violates their property and their actual possessions in the labor that acquires their daily subsistence and in the hallowed remnant of time which ought to relieve their fatigues. That means when you're watching ESPN. <laughs> relieve their fatigues and soothe their cares. Such a government is not a pattern for the United States. That's actually a pretty radical position. We need to protect people's pursuit of happiness. If the United States mean to obtain or deserve the full praise due to wise and just governments, they will equally respect the rights of property and the property and rights. 
They will rival the government that most sacredly guards the former, former, and by repelling its example and violating the latter, will make themselves a pattern to that and all other governments. So he's very helpful. So we make sure you understand this comparison. Locke and Madison think that rights pre-exist the state. The state is organized by consent of the governed to protect that property. Rousseau thinks that rights are a product of the contract itself. The contract comes first and then the rights. And the rights then are collect created by the collective. The individual has rights, but those rights are a product of the intention and needs of the collective, not just by virtue of me being a citizen. So the time when this comes up is important is, does my dog own my house? Now, the essayist Anthony de Jasse wrote a famous essay, My Dog Does Not Own My House. Let me explain. Suppose that there is a community of us, and we notice people keep stealing our stuff. And we build the house, and people take parts of it, they take the copper wire, we get tired of it. And so we say, you know what? If we were to buy a dog and train it, to protect our property, then we could have our property be secure. But dogs are pretty expensive. They're hard to take care of. Let's all cooperate. We'll all contribute and get a community dog. So we put in money. We get a community dog. We train it. And it works pretty well. Anybody who tries to steal stuff, the dog just bites the heck out of it. And the dog is well trained. It only bites people that break the law. One day, if Locke is right and property pre-exists the state, we're not worried that the dog owns the house. But one day, we notice the dog's been injecting himself with human growth hormone. <laughs> He's a really big, strong dog. We think, cool. This is great. He's going to be able to protect us much better from foreign attack. But then we come home one day, and there on the couch is our dog cleaning my Remington 870 pump shotgun <laughs> and drinking my good scotch and watching the NCAA tournament on ESPN. And I say, whoa, dog, what are you doing? You know, I was thinking, you wouldn't even have this house if it weren't for me. You wouldn't have any property. All this stuff that you value, your security, you wouldn't have any of it. That business you have, you didn't build that. I think I own all this. Now, I like you, and I'm going to let you use it. <laughs> But the only reason you get to use it is that I like you. Because I'm the badass dog. Now his name is T. And so you say, T, what are you doing? He says, no, nope, I've decided. You say, stay, stay T, stay T. Oh man, look what's happened. You can't make T stay. He's become the state. So at what point does a stupid, smelly dog that we hire to protect our property become something that can tell us, you didn't build that? Because it may be true that we wouldn't have a house at all without the security. But we wouldn't have electricity in the house if we had to pay for the wiring. The guy comes in, he puts the wiring in, we pay him. He doesn't own the house. Our house would be no good without a roof. I pay our roofer. He puts the roof on. I pay him. We're done. He doesn't own my house. Why is it that whatever provides security to protect our property owns our house? Well, it depends which of these two views of property you have. On the Lockheed view, they would not. On the Rosovian view, they do. They're both legitimate views. 
I just want you to see what a big difference it makes. Whether property owners hire a big smelly dog named State, or whether the existence of the social contract is what produces order and community in the first place. And decisions about who owns property is, are then collective and not individual. Let me talk about two interesting cases on property that compare these two different views. First one is one of the most interesting cases in the history of property law. Hinman versus Pacific Air Transport, 1936. Now in 1936, we're just seeing the beginnings of commercial air flights. The rule for property was ad coelo. Ad coelo means to the heavens. It's a concept in Roman law. So if I own a piece of land, I own the rectangular cone that goes down to the center of the earth. I own all the mineral rights under it. And I own the air above it, to the heavens, at Coelho. Well, there were airplanes flying over. They were delivering mail, and there was beginnings of passenger service in 1936. The farmer, Hinman, said that these airplanes were really loud and scaring his chickens. They weren't laying eggs. So notice that he might have a nuisance action. He might have a nuisance action in the sense the noise was bothering his chickens. Let's put that aside. I mean, that's an objective question. If there's a nuisance, then okay. He also said that under the Ed Coelho doctrine, he owned the air over his land to the heavens, and this airplane was flying through it. That's a trespass. So he brought, he brought a nuisance action and a trespass action. The trespass action is more interesting. Was the plane trespassing? Well, if it had been a bus service, clearly, unless there's an easement that says I could cross your land, you're trespassing if the bus drives across my land. How about an airplane? So the Ed Coelum rule, and so that the, you can see the problem, we have a farm, it goes straight up into the air. Are we really going to tie air service in knots to have to obtain separate easements from every little piece of land that they fly over. That would basically mean we can't have air service. On the other hand, if you think property is something that people own and it's not controlled by the collective, who are we to say? It's their property. That's the end of that. Well, what the judge decided, Hinman sued for an injunction, He argued that the rule should give him the right to enjoin it. Let me just say, well, remember what Rousseau would have said. So all I'm doing is re-quoting what I said before. You actually, I have a little sympathy for Rousseau here. Suppose someone says, this is mine. This air is mine. I'm putting up an invisible fence that goes all the way to the heavens. Shouldn't somebody say, throw out this imposter, because that's not real property? That's what the judge did. Found for the defendant, the airline. But the judge really had to do that because it's more economically efficient. There's too many opportunities for holdup. In fact, the judge questioned whether it was ever really the law, because it couldn't have been trespassed because it wasn't possible to trespass before people could fly. So there was a change by the order of a judge in the nature of property rights all over the United States without compensation. Because you look at the Fifth Amendment and it seems to say that if we take something for a public purpose, you have to receive compensation. Well, maybe this is a public purpose because we need airlines. We need air delivery of mail. But we're taking something from it. The judge said, no, we can define property rights in the terms that depend on what's good for the public, not what's good for the property owner. And I have to say, looking at these facts, it's pretty hard to think anything else was even possible, much less desirable. 
The second case, Jock versus Steenberg Homes. This is more recent, Wisconsin 1997. So Steenberg was the defendant. They had sold a mobile home to Jacques, who's the plaintiff. Forgive me, to Jacques' neighbor. Let me start over. Steenberg had sold a mobile home, a trailer, to Jacques' neighbor. Now, in order to deliver the motorhome, the mobile home, they had to be able to go down a dirt road and then make a 90 degree turn. And the, the, the trailer was too long to do that. So they couldn't make a 90 degree turn, there were trees, and then deliver it to the neighbor. They had to get there somehow. But Jock owned a farm. It's just big, wide open land. All they have to do is take the mobile home across it. So Steenberg said, can we take this trailer across your land? And Jacques said no. He had been the victim of an action for adverse possession two years before. He'd lost a long fence where the fence had been on his property, but the neighbor said that that's really the fence. We're going to move the property line. So Jacques had already lost something on an adverse, select, uh, adverse possession action. So he was reluctant to say, yes, you can take this across my land. Steenberg asked again, sent a letter, can we deliver this mobile home? Your neighbor, it's your neighbor for heaven's sakes. He's already paid for it. All we want to do is take it across your land. Now you might say, aren't they going to tear up the land? It's winter in Wisconsin. It's a skating rink. It's easy to push that thing across on two by fours. It's not going to mark up anything. Jacques said no. Steenberg asked a third time, sent a sheriff to deliver a certified mail. Jacques said no. <clears throat> he delivered it. <laughs> they plowed it and then pulled the trailer across Jacques' land. Jock sued Steenberg for trespass. The jury found Steenberg guilty, as they clearly were. They admitted they were. A sheriff had already delivered a trespassing ticket for $35. And Steenberg had paid that. Jock sued for punitive damage. Wisconsin law does not allow for punitive damages larger than three times the actual damages. The actual damages the jury had found were one dollar. Because <laughs> there's not really any damage. It's frozen solid. They pushed it across. I mean, one dollar is actually generous. It was nothing. <laughs> the jury, I have it on the previous slide, $100,000. $100,000, because the jury doesn't really care about the law. The jury said, it's not right. It's not right. You shouldn't be able to do this. So they awarded punitive damages in, in $100,000. Steenberg asked the judge in the appeal to set that judgment aside because Wisconsin law says it can't be more than three times. It would seem like the law is sort of messed up, though, because it can't be true that you say in advance, I'm going to trespass. No, you're not. I am. No, the law will stop you. And the law says, here's a ticket for $35. Well, one of the great things about these sort of tort cases is the older cases in common law. So the judge, in writing his opinion, cites a case from 1814 in England. And this is so great. A landowner was shooting birds, and this, this is from the 1814 decision. This is an English common law case. A landowner was shooting birds in his field when he was approached by the local magistrate who wanted to hunt with him. The landowner said, no, I don't like you. <laughs> the magistrate proceeded to hunt. The landowner continued to object. The magistrate threatened to have him jailed and dared him to file suit. 
Although little actual harm had been caused, the English court upheld damages of 500 pounds, which is a fortune in 1814. Explaining, in a case where a man disregards every principle which actuates the conduct of gentlemen, what is to restrain him except large damages? So they're basically invoking manners. That's tenuous. But the judge has a hypothetical, which I'm sorry I have to read in a Monty Python voice. So from that case, this is the hypothetical that the judge posed. Okay, I was lying about the Monty, but imagine it's Monty Python. <laughs> Suppose a gentleman has a paved walk in his paddock before his window, and then a man intrudes and walks up and down before the window of his house, and looks in while the owner is at dinner. It's a trespasser permitted to say, here's a happening, for which is the full extent of the mis mischief I have done. Would that be compensation? I cannot say that it would be. So the guy's walking around. He hasn't done any damage. But I've got to be able to stop it. Not to say you have a ticket for $35. That's an admission fee. I have to have some way of stopping you. Well, judge found for the plaintiff. He found for Jacques. The right to exclude has social benefits. Sovereignty over property, the goal of home ownership promotes civil responsibility, care for property, avoid violence, and so on. And the judge actually said, let's imagine that we enforce the law that Steenberg is invoking. What's going to happen? People go get shot. That's one of the reasons we have trespassing laws, is that the state prevents you from trespassing. If you just say, you can walk back and forth on my paddock and watch me while I'm having my dinner. Yes, sir, he's here again. He's watching me while I have my dinner. So the judge found that the property was inviolable. But in social terms, there was no harm. The guy was just being a jerk. It's clearly better to allow the property right to be violated, to declare a temporary easement, to make up some mumbo jumbo, but he did not. So there are these two views of property. Could be that it's a bundle of sticks divide, decided by majorities, and we might call that rights in persona. We have rights against a small and defined class. You have the rights that are specified only. Or we might have rights in rem the right to exclude. Majorities or others be damned. And that's more like job. We have rights against a large and indefinite class. That is, you have rights unless they are explicitly proscribed. And our property laws are a jumble of these two things. They're just a jumble of these two rationales. And I think that we have to think in those terms to recognize how complicated our views of property are. So. Let me say a little bit about, about property. I'm at liberty to use a thing P if I have no duty to refrain. I have a right to P if I am at liberty and others are not at liberty. So property is a right to use and a right to exclude. It's a combination of a right to use and a right to exclude. That means that a property right in the full sense implies a right to say no. There's three ways we might protect property. We have a property rule, there's no transfer without permission. A liability rule, there's no transfer without compensation. Or inalienability, there's no transfer at all. So how would you enforce a property rule? The first one. That's more like the Jacques case. A liability rule means that if I violate your property, I owe you whatever damages I've caused. <coughs> but if there's no damages, that doesn't seem very satisfactory. How are we going to judge what damages you've caused? <coughs> so the judge was trying to track, in the Hinman case, what institutional framework enables people to live well together, what enables people to mind their own business, 
and how to avoid creating property rights that empower people to hold each other up for ransom. That's the sort of system that we would hope would evolve. This is like a coyote. Efficient rights probably are going to evolve because we're not sure what set of rights are going to prevent holding up for ransom. So an evolved property system puts people in a position to produce, to trade. It fosters creative destruction. If I make an iPod, Sony cannot sue me saying, you've damaged me because I make Walkman. But I mean, the Sony Walkman got wiped out. 10,000 people got laid off. Those are real damages. Why couldn't Sony sue Apple? Because you have no right to sue for damages in the context of commercial competition. The problem is, you may be able, by hiring lobbyists, to get yourself that right. In a crony capitalist system, you could get yourself that right. We want to limit externalities, limit transactions cost, enable producers to grow their business, but still conforms to our moral institutions about justice. It's difficult to satisfy all seven of those things. Let me skip a couple because time's going. Should majorities decide everything? The problem is democracy and majority rule are not synonyms. Majority rule is a way of choosing. Democracy is a system that ensures government is responsive both to majorities and to individuals. That's why democratic constitutions have two parts. First, the domain, or proper limits on what we can decide collectively. And second, the process by which we will decide. The problem, if we choose majority rule, is that the majority may want to decide everything, not just the issues in the proper domain set out by the Constitution. Let's look at two examples. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man was written in August 1789. Most people would say that the French were creating a democracy, but look at their protection for freedom of religion, speech, and the press. No one is to be disquieted because of his opinions, even religious, provided their manifestation does not disturb the public order established by law. Free communication of ideas and opinions is one of the most precious of the rights of man. Consequently, Every citizen may speak, write, and print freely, subject to responsibility for the abuse of such liberty in cases determined by law. Rules like this can't possibly limit majorities. These rights say you can say or do anything, but is it against the law? What kind of a protection is that? The American Bill of Rights was written less than a month later, September 1789. Here's the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's an explicit protection against the majority, not don't break the law, but don't make the law. Some individual choices are protected from government interference, even in instances where the majority of people would disagree with those choices. But this distinctly American conception of protections against majorities has been eroded in the years since that summer of 1789. Our courts have generally protected political and religious freedoms, but some other individual freedoms, like the economic freedom that the founders would have held to be just as important, have been systematically gutted. Take a recent example the 2005 Supreme Court case of Kelo versus New London. Ms. Kelo had an old house in an old section of New London, Connecticut. A private real estate developer offered Ms. Kelo money for her house because he wanted to build on the land. But she said no, she didn't want to sell. The developer could have tried to pay her more to convince her to sell voluntarily. But he had a better idea. He went to the city council and convinced the elected officials that everyone would be better off if the house were torn down and the condos were built. Since the majority of citizens preferred the greater tax revenue, the city council voted yes. Ms. Kilo tried to fight the decision and took her case to the Supreme Court. And how did the court rule? Well, the Bill of Rights says, private property shall not be taken for public use without just compensation. This was clearly not a public use. 
the city was being asked to take Ms. Kilo's private property and give it to another private party, the developer. So that should have answered things pretty clearly, right? Wrong. The Supreme Court found that the city council was justified because the increased taxes would serve a public purpose. So in the spirit of benefiting the majority, the court declined to protect an individual right. But that's wrong. The government has to protect the individual and her property, even if the majority wants something else. That's an essential part of the US Constitution and of our democracy. Without it, we just substitute the tyranny of a king for the tyranny of a larger group. When majorities always win, each of us loses. It's important not to confuse majority rule with a just democratic government. Watching that video, a little odd to me. I, I weighed 270 pounds when I made that. One of the commenters said I looked like Patrick, the starfish. Which I felt was sort of harsh, but not inaccurate, just in terrible. So, the reason to show that video is that that's the sort of trouble that we get into. Now, obviously, I have a perspective on this, and you may disagree, but those two different conceptions of property are constantly at war. And the system that we have is and probably has to be a muddle between them. I would think that both the Hinman and the Steenberg cases were correctly decided. But that means that I have an incoherent view of property. But recognizing why it's incoherent and why it might encompass civil rights or what, what Madison called property and rights is also important. So, I want to leave you with, Madison's conception of property is very important. That dominion which one man claims and exercises over the external things of the world in exclusion of every, every other individual. That's basically a Lockean view. Rights pre-exist the creation of institutions. So for that reason, he said, governments are instituted. But if government is contingent on the enforcement of rights, it's not true that rights enforcement is contingent on which, on the whims of government or of majorities. So I hope you feel like you know something more now about why you should be confused about property. Thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.